The history of steam locomotion on the railways of Great Britain spanned a period in excess of one and a half centuries. In that period, the steam locomotive was developed from the crude, slow machine of the early days into a powerful, fast prime mover, capable of handling virtually any kind of traffic suitable for railway transportation. Development was very rapid in the first half of the steam locomotive's commercial life. The early engines could barely reach double-figure speeds, but that wasn't too important when they were used to haul freight over relatively short distances. But the opening of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway in 1829 changed all that, as it was designed from the outset to carry passengers, and this led to competition to produce faster machines. Its Rainhill trials were won by the legendary rocket, which was the first man-made machine to exceed 30 miles per hour. Thereafter, steam locomotive development progressed along two parallel lines, freight traffic requiring more power and passenger more speed. Throughout the 19th century, locomotive engineers built larger and faster steam locomotives, whilst in the 20th century, when other forms of transport began to eat away at the railway's monopoly, they broke the magic 100 mile per hour barrier, reaching the highest speeds of all in the 1930s, the decade of speed. The image of the railways in the 1930s is one of success. The Great Western's chocolate and cream coaches were an enduring symbol of a railway at the height of its power and prestige. Every schoolboy knew the Cornish Riviera Express, with its magnificent castles and kings. And railways were the accepted way to travel, whether for pleasure or for work, for passengers or for freight. But the 30s started on a sour note. The strikes of the 1920s had foreshadowed growing social unrest and the Wall Street crash had heralded the Great Depression, which was to dominate the early years of the decade. On the railways, there was a downturn in business, which was to result in the laying up of many locomotives. However, this coincided with a time when many locomotives were due for replacement in any event. The golden era of the late Victorian and early Edwardian times having produced a large stock of locomotives reaching the end of their economic lives by the beginning of the 30s. On no railway was this more apparent than on the Great Western Railway. The abolition of the broad gauge in 1892 and the consequent re-equipping of the locomotive stock which had taken place under Dean and Churchwood had resulted in a requirement to rebuild or replace many different types of engine. In addition, the locomotives of the various smaller companies absorbed by the GWR in the 1923 grouping were deemed non-standard whilst changed operating requirements allied to improvements to the infrastructure meant that larger locomotives could be employed. Under Churchwood, the GWR was amongst the first to embrace wholehearted standardization, and its unique position amongst the big four, effectively untouched by the grouping, meant that this policy could be continued unchanged by his successor Charles Collett. This had already become obvious at the end of the 20s, when the first generation Churchwood engines, now over a quarter of a century old, became due for replacement. The counties and county tanks could be replaced by six coupled machines, and were to be seen on Swindon's famous dump alongside the products of the Dean era, with their double frames and enormous domes. The churchwood boilers of the double-framed cities at Barras and Bulldogs could yield reusable standard fittings for further use. But these tanks of the Welsh-absorbed companies would go forever. Churchwood's own 242 tanks had been superseded by 262s and double frames abandoned for new construction in the first decade of the century.
One style of locomotive, the 042 tank, epitomized by the 517 class, had no suitable replacement design. So new locomotives, the 4800 class, were built to what was effectively the same design. The South Wales tanks had already been replaced by the 5600s. Of course, not all the obsolete designs could be withdrawn at once, replacement taking some considerable time. Freight locomotive replacement was generally far slower than for passenger stock. The double-frame Aberdares, contemporaries of the cities and Atbaras, which were replaced by castles and halls, were to see the decade out in comparative security. The first not going until 1934, many surviving until after the war. By this time, of course, they displayed all the standard features such as top feed and superheated combed boilers, as seen here at Fenny Compton. The Aberdares had been thus named due to their association with the South Wales coal traffic. During the 1920s, a series of powerful 062 tanks, the 5600 class, had been built specifically for this traffic to replace the non-standard inherited locomotive types. Scrap and build was to be one of the 1930s philosophies. 460s of various types were built for mainline duties, but no more of the light 262 tanks. The Churchwood moguls were to see use until the end of steam on the western. The 4800s allowed most of the 517042 tanks, now around half a century old and heavily modified, to be withdrawn. Only a few of the bulldogs, nominally replaced by halls, granges and manors, appeared on the scrap lines as economic reality began to bite. Many of these secondary engines would survive through the decade. By contrast, the Toplink stars began to be withdrawn in the 30s, although Glastonbury Abbey, seen here at Worcester, was from a batch of 12 built in 1922. The survival of the Bulldogs was partly due to the need for some medium-powered locomotives for secondary lines, but rebuilding was also to affect them from 1936 onwards, as some were converted to form a new class, the Duke Dogs. These used Bulldog frames with Duke boilers. There were quite large numbers of the smaller locomotives of the light tank and freight classes, such as the double-framed 2361 class 060s, which survived the Holocaust. Worcester Shed had a large allocation of these for use on the secondary lines which radiated from the city. Another bulldog can be seen alongside its effective successor, a hall, mass production of which was virtually constant from 1928 to 1941. Only in 1932 and 1934 were none produced. The Halls were Collett's most numerous class, the prime example of the standardization policy, as they were capable of virtually all types of work, being fitted with six-foot driving wheels. A few moguls were built in one of the Hall hiatus years, 1932, but when 5 foot 8 inch 460s were required, 100 of the moguls were withdrawn to provide the bases of 80 granges and 20 manors. This reuse of parts was a feature of standardization, but rebuilding was an accountant's term in the 30s as various government grants were available at different times for new construction or rebuilding. Some rebuilds were really new engines, whilst some new ones were actually rebuilds. The various tanks known collectively as panniers were the backbone of the GWR shunting fleet, and a number of the early engines are seen at Worcester. Mass production in the 30s was on a replacement basis, using the same design which had gradually evolved in the early part of the century. Although primarily designed for shunting duties, these 5700s took on many of the duties of the Bulldogs and Prairies on the cross-country and branch lines as well. The history of the Panniers was long and complicated. They had their origins in the saddle tanks of the late Victorian period with varieties produced both by Swindon and Wolverhampton. Conversion to pannier tanks accompanied the fitting of Belpaire fireboxes and was still taking place in the 30s.
However, some, including number 648, built at Wolverhampton in 1872, were never converted. By the time it was filmed here, it had been withdrawn in July 1932. The construction of the large prairies was in two phases. As we saw in the first program of this series, Churchwood introduced the type in 1903 and built 40 with standard number two boilers and 30 county tanks. By the early 30s, these were due for replacement. Collett updated the prairie design and used it for all new construction, building 170 examples between 1929 and 1939. These changes can be appreciated at Paddington, where, in addition to the changes wrought by the newly built prairies, on the express passenger front, the downgrading of Churchwood Saints and Stars could be observed in the early 30s. Both types had been replaced by the Castles and Kings on frontline expresses. Construction of castles recommenced in 1932, after a period of five years. There were 131 of them by the time war broke out once again. Ten stars were rebuilt and 75 new engines were built during the decade. The Paddington Prairies differed from the main series by having higher boiler pressure and were numbered in the 6100s. The county tanks were withdrawn as the 6100s were built. The scene was completed with panniers and moguls. The prairies were used on outer suburban work, as had been the county tanks, which were fitted with water pickup apparatus. These trains made quite long journeys to places such as High Wycombe, Didcot and Newbury. Milk churns were still in general use in the 30s and were carried in special slatted vans known on the Great Western as siphons. A rare view, number 354, the last of the double-framed Bayer Goods 060s, runs light in the early 30s. She was withdrawn in 1934. The Bayer is followed by the prototype King, distinguished by its bell, a souvenir of its 1927 visit to the USA. It's seen approaching Leamington with a down express. From the bridge spanning the north end of Hatton Station, we see a large prairie coming off the line from Beerley and Stratford. It's followed by another member of the same class with a mainline local from Birmingham to Leamington, making a connection for the Stratford train. A Down Express is headed by another king. Only the Bristol and West of England and Birmingham main lines were authorised for kings, ten of which were built in 1930. Thereafter, all express locomotive construction was of castles. Although normally associated with branches and cross-country lines, the small prairies often appeared on main line turns. Hatton had a triangular junction at its north end, allowing trains from the Beerley line a direct link in the Birmingham direction. We are now going to follow the line in the up direction towards London in 1932, as is this King. Six of the class were shedded at Wolverhampton in this year for the London Expresses. A star follows. How are the mighty fallen? Only 20 years separate the two designs, and the king's parentage is very obvious. The star now shares local duties with the prairies, another of which is seen with a branch train for Beerley and Stratford-upon-Avon. Coming off the branch is a bulldog on a mixed freight. This line formed a link between the main line to London and the North Warwickshire line via Henley and Arden. The latter had been opened in 1907, and formed part of the GWR's expansion in the early years of the century, as it became part of a new main line from Birmingham via Stratford to the southwest. At the same time, the London to Birmingham main line, which we are following, was upgraded with the opening of a cutoff via Bicester in 1910.
So the story of these lines is very much a 20th century one. These views are on Hatton Bank, between the station and Warwick. As a latecomer, the Birmingham main line is perhaps the least known of the GWR's main lines and was vulnerable to the cost-cutting ways of the nationalised railways in the 1960s. The Bista cut-off being singled and downgraded and the expresses withdrawn. The only towns of note were the county town Warwick, seen here, and Leamington Spa, both of which are rich in heritage. However, we are viewing the line at the peak of its importance as the GWR fights the LMS for the lucrative traffic between the Midlands and the south of England, evidenced by these scenes at Leamington with more prairies, a star and a hall. The GWR station was adjacent to an LMS one on the old LNWR lines from Rugby and Coventry. These engines are calling at the GWR's up platform, behind which the LMS lines run parallel. The GWR signal box stands between the rival lines, both of which ran southwest from the station on a series of viaducts. The Prairie's train includes clear story stock and a gas wagon at the rear. The Prairies were monopolizing local workings by the middle of the decade. The Collet general production type was the 5101 class, as the original Churchwood class were the 5100s. It wasn't considered necessary to supply the Birmingham district with the higher boiler pressure version, the 6100s, as used in the London area. Also by this time, the stars were on their last range of duties on secondary services, large numbers being allocated to Shrewsbury, Wolverhampton and Worcester sheds from the beginning of the decade. Castles supplemented the Kings on the main expresses. Not all of these stopped at Leamington, slip coaches being employed to serve the spa on down trains. The station itself underwent modernization during the 1930s. We are following the line south from Leamington. As trains leave the town, they are faced with a six mile climb, starting with Whitnash cutting. Here we see a southbound hall followed by a northbound prairie on a freight. The gradient was in the southbound direction. From either end of the bridge spanning the shallow cutting, we see a number of southbound trains, from a short one behind a castle to a pair of heavy trains headed by another star and a hall. Both these trains consist in the main of southern coaches of Mansell design. There was considerable traffic between the two railways, consisting of through coaches from the south coast to Birkenhead via Reading and Oxford, many of which we'll see in this series. After Whitnash, the railway heads southeast on a long embankment, crossing a wide farming district. There are no towns of any note between Leamington and Banbury, the most notable man-made feature of this area being the Roman Foss Way. Just after crossing it, the railway starts the final part of the climb to Harbury, a pair of refuge sidings being sighted here in order to provide banking assistance to the summit. These sidings were known as Foss Road. Passenger trains, of course, were able to have a good run at the bank, which culminated in the wide Harbury cutting, whose shallow banks resulted from a bad slip during construction in 1850. Thanks to these heavy works, the gradient was kept to 1 in 187 up from Foss Road. The cutting is 110 feet deep here. At the eastern end of the cutting is the short Harbury Tunnel. It would have been longer than its 73 yards if the ground had been more stable. The castle, with its short train, is heading downhill towards Leamington. From the summit, the line runs downhill to Fanny Compton, with a third running line in the down direction between Greve Siding and Southam Road and Harbury, a small wayside station a mile or so from each of the places it served. Here we see a southbound saint crawl through the station after the six-mile climb from Leamington.
Due to its position at the top of the climb, Southern Road and Harbury boasted a refuge siding for up freights, so they could get out of the way of following expresses. Down trains had an easier task up from Fanny Compton. A Dean Goods is heading north through the station with an engineer's train. Effortlessly breasting the top of the climb is another king on a southbound express. Our last Great Western scene features another heavy freight engine of the 2800 class. The makeup of this train is particularly interesting as it includes driving coaches and pullmans for the Southern's Brighton electrification, being delivered from the builder's Metropolitan Camel of Birmingham. The Southern is our next port of call, disembarking from the steamer at Ride Pierhead like so many holidaymakers between the wars. We'll first look at the self-contained pier tramway line, which boasted these little Drury trams. They'd been provided in 1927 by the Southern, which had taken over the tramway three years earlier. The original horse-drawn cars were used as trailers. The island was enjoying the peak of its prosperity as a holiday destination at this time. The availability of holidays with pay had opened up the trade and over two million visitors a year were crossing the Solent and Spithead to enjoy its unique atmosphere. However, most of them came in the two peak summer months and therein lay the foundation of the extensive island railway system and the problems of operating it. The former LSWR class 02 tanks were transferred to the island by the Southern Railway from the beginning of the 1920s, further examples being taken over by ferry in the 1930s. They proved to be the perfect motive power for the Isle of Wight lines, being able to handle the heaviest trains the lines could cope with. The transfer of the O2s was part of the Southern's modernization scheme for the island railways. But it was all done on a very tight budget, using second-hand equipment. Although small, the Isle of Wight had supported three independent railways. The Isle of Wight Central, its main line running through Ryde to Newport and Cowes, the impoverished Freshwater and Yarmouth Railway, and the most prosperous, the Isle of Wight Railway, serving Sandown, Shanklin and Ventnor. At Ride Shed, we see the changeover from the traditional locomotives to the new O2s, the youngest of which was built in 1892, number 17 Sea View, dating from December 1891. Nineteen years older was Roxall, a Bayer Peacock 240 tank of the Isle of Wight Railway, seen alongside another of its successors. This was the last survivor of the indigenous island locomotives, being withdrawn in 1933. 240s had become the effective standard for both the Isle of Wight and Isle of Wight Central Railways, but due to their age, replacement was a necessity for the Southern. The O2s were the product of the fertile mind of William Adams of the London and South Western Railway, most of whose beautifully proportioned 440s were to be withdrawn in the 1930s. This X6 is seen on Bournemouth Shed alongside a Drummond M7, which took over some of the duties of the transferred O2s, number 47 being fitted in 1930 with motor train gear. Most of Drummond's successful designs survived intact through the 30s, including the L11 440s. The 40 members of this class were a mixed traffic version of the legendary T9 Greyhounds. Robert Urey's N15 460s were the basis of Mansell's rather more famous King Arthur's and were incorporated into that class. The Southern was different from all the other railways in that its principal traffic was passengers. Comparatively little freight was carried, for which Mansell produced an update of the Southwestern S15 class mixed traffic engines, a small wheeled variant of the King Arthur's.
During the 1930s, the Arthurs were the main express power of the Southern, dominating the LSWR mainline to Bournemouth, despite the later schools and Lord Nelson classes. The latter were rather disappointing and subjected to a number of modifications. One, number 857 Lord Howe, was fitted with a large boiler in 1937 as a prototype for a Pacific design Mansell was proposing for the Bournemouth line. But he retired that year and was succeeded by the controversial Oliver Bullard. During the late 30s, Bullard's influence was felt only in his application of brighter liveries and exhaust modifications to the Nelsons and schools. But the Southern's management had embarked on an extensive electrification program, which left little room for steam development, so the older classes continued to solder on. By the beginning of the 1930s, the LMS had apparently solved the problem of its frontline express power with the 70 Royal Scots. Whilst the story of the hurried ordering and construction of the first 50 Scots belongs to the 1920s, the final batch of 20 didn't appear until 1930. At the beginning of the decade, Sir Henry Fowler remained in charge of LMS locomotive affairs. He had planned a Pacific design in 1926, but been overruled by the operators, resulting in the Royal Scots, which were regarded as a special case for use on the former LNWR West Coast Main Line only. The Scots were, in many respects, non-standard, as they had been built and designed by an outside contractor, the North British Locomotive Company of Glasgow. However, many LMS standard details were used and by the early 30s a considerable number of questions were being asked about the Scots. Bearings ran hot, the smoke box supports often caused steam leakage and the fuel consumption was very high. Smoke deflectors were the most obvious outward signs of modification, but piston ring changes were much more significant. In 1932, Fowler retired and William Stanier became CME. He continued the policy of detail improvements, replacing the unsatisfactory Midland-derived fittings and bearings. By 1936, when they received new tenders, they were virtually a different type of engine to that produced in 1927. The Scots had taken over the West Coast main line duties from the LNWR Clortons. The latter were classified 5P in the LMS power rating system, whilst the Scots were class 6P. The standard passenger locomotives were the Midland-derived 4P compounds, so as the Clortons were not considered very effective, there was a gap in the fleet for effective mid-range passenger locomotives. The initial solution was to fit larger boilers to 20 Clortons in 1928. These rebuilds were classified 5XP to indicate that they were more powerful than their unaltered classmates, but their chassis were still their weak point. It was therefore decided in 1930 to fit the larger boiler to a new chassis, which was a development of the Royal Scott type. The first two were still described as rebuilt Clortons and used a few bits from those engines, including their wheels, although the enginemen refer to them as baby Scots. There was a long period of evaluation before further engines were produced, which was part of a wholesale review of the cost of locomotive running instituted by the LMS chairman, Lord Stamp. This showed that it was more cost-effective to build new, efficient standard locomotives than to patch up old designs. This led to the famous scrap-and-build policy, which Stanier was brought in to implement. The Patriots, as the 5XPs were officially designated, were one of the earlier manifestations of this policy, which was to see the wholesale slaughter of LNWR passenger classes. Fifty more Patriots were built, all after Stanier arrived, and he then modified the design to use his own type of boiler, producing the Jubilees, 
They were mass-produced from 1934 to 36, until the LMS had no fewer than 243 5XPs. At first, the Jubilees were none too successful and weren't as good as the Patriots. However, with so many of them having been built, they had to succeed. And by 1937, the problems which related to steaming were cured. The Jubilees then became the frontline engines on the Midland Division as well as the supporting cast for the Scots and later Pacifics on the old Northwestern lines, where we see a pair engaged on Royal Train duties. The Jubilees, as their history shows, weren't really Stanier engines. The only true Stanier feature was the taper boiler, which was a development of the Churchwood principles of the GWR from which company Stanier had come to the LMS. This was also to be found on the next class we see. There were really only three original Stanier designs. The most famous is undoubtedly the mixed traffic Black 5. This two-cylinder 460 design was to become the epitome of the LMS, as it was one of the most truly all-purpose types of locomotive in the history of Britain's railways. At home on express passenger trains, as well as mixed freights, 842 were to be built, together with a scarcely altered 172 British Railways examples. 472 of these were built in the 30s, and they were soon to be seen on all parts of the LMS system, the most notable engines of the scrap and build philosophy. Stanier's first design was the LMS's first Pacific type. Two prototypes were built in 1933, and they were followed by a production batch of ten two years later. The objective was to produce a locomotive capable of through running from London to Glasgow. The Scots had to be changed at Carlisle, their narrow fireboxes requiring cleaning by them. The princesses, with their wide fireboxes, could go considerably further before the fire became choked. Like the Jubilees, they experienced teething troubles. But the application of high superheating cured this, and they took over the prestige work in the middle years of our decade. The scrap and build policy was to extend to all parts of the LMS system, and to all types of locomotives. However, it was apparent that the former LNWR classes were to see the most rapid replacement. The LNWR's locomotive policy, satisfactory types being allowed to run basically unaltered, was different from that of the Midland Railway, where locomotives were constantly rebuilt to current specifications. Replacement of Midland types was not so noticeable, as that railway's dominance in locomotive matters in the 1920s had meant that the LMS continued to build Midland types. Even replacements for LNWR engines were of Midland appearance. No small tank engines were built in the 1920s, the LNWR 242s and Midland 044s being sufficient for local duties. However, by the end of the decade, the oldest ones were very old, and some replacements were needed. Derby Drawing Office came up with a series of Class 3P262 tanks, 70 of which were built from 1930 to 1932. Stania altered the design by substituting his own boiler, and built another 170 of them, the variety seen here, from 1935 to 1938. Both varieties of 3P were very feeble, unlike the slightly larger 4P-264 tanks, first produced by Fowler in 1927, which are seen next. These had their origins in a study under Hughes, and were effectively based on his highly successful crabs. The smaller 3Ps were a totally separate design in the true Midland tradition, and suffered accordingly. The Fowler 264s were continued under Stanier, the last batch having a modified cab, until there were 125 examples by 1934, 50 of which were built in the 1930s. Their main duties were on London suburban services, 
As always, Stanier changed the design only by the substitution of his own taper boilers. 86 were built in the 30s, and they were as successful as the earlier machines. On the freight side, the picture was similar. The LNWR Super D080s were the best of the inherited stock, and the earlier classes continued to be updated to the final design. However, they weren't really suitable for the faster freight services, for which the Hughes-designed crabs had proved to be the best of the early LMS standard types. Building of the original design of crabs continued until 1932, by which time there were 245 of them, after which Stanier substituted his boiler and changed the layout of the cylinders and valve gear for new construction. The only modification to the original Hughes crabs was the fitment of Lenz rotary valve gear to five engines in 1931. Similarly, ACFI feed water gear fitted to the last three built was the only modification to the unsatisfactory 7F Austin 7s, of which another 75 were built in the 1930s. Here was a design that wouldn't be improved by the addition of a Stanier boiler. So the third totally new Stanier design was for heavy freight, the Class 8F-280, originally also designated Class 7F. They were an instant success and production started in 1935. Although they were to become amongst the most numerous class of all time, the LMS only had 126 of them by the end of the decade. It's curious to note that the Stanier boilers on the Jubilees, Black Fives and the 8Fs were all unique to their classes, despite being very close in their dimensions, the antithesis of standardization in the Churchwood sense. We've now moved on to the LNWR main line to experience the variety of traffic and locomotives employed by the LMS in the middle of the 1930s. Brinklow was the first wayside station after Rugby on the Trent Valley line to Stafford and the North. At this period, the original Royal Scots dominated express workings, supplemented by the five XPs of both Fowler and Stanier varieties. A black five shows one side of its nature on a fast van train. The other side of the Black Five character is revealed on a short passenger train. By this time, scrap and build was in full flow, so the days of this northwestern Prince of Wales were numbered. Bearing the name Scott, she waits as a princess sails majestically by. The Prince of Wales class was the LNWR's equivalent of the Black Fives which were replacing them. Scott was already downgraded to a two-coach local, and an extra 20,000 on her number showed she'd already been replaced in capital stock. Appropriately, she's followed by two more Scots of a different kind.
A Patriot approaches on an 11 coach train. It's noticeable that the Scots handled the longer trains and the Princess had 15 on. A crab rumbles through with a long freight. Despite the competition from the roads, the railway still carried the vast bulk of long-distance freight traffic in the mid-30s. Note the variety here. At Brinklow's platform ends, the classic LNWR signals remained. Such infrastructure was a longer-lasting memory of the pre-grouping companies than some locomotives and rolling stock. But it too would be replaced in time by new LMS standard items. This brand new Jubilee is on unusual stock, but far more interesting are the two 5XPs on a fitted freight. Remaining in the same period, we move south to Rugby Station itself, as a jubilee departs and a crab shunts in the yards on the north side of the station, followed by a Super D running light. The activity is continued by another jubilee shunting passenger stock, before a Patriot speeds through with an express. Rugby has always been one of the most important junctions on the West Coast Main Line, as it marks the point where the Trent Valley route diverges from the original London and Birmingham route to the latter city. In addition, Rugby was the junction for the first Midland Railway route to the south from Leicester, as well as for the LNWR lines to Market Harbour and Leamington Spa. The Northampton Loop also rejoins the main line at Rugby. A princess heads south. The final Stania Pacifics were shrouded in streamlined casings. It's said that Stania objected to having to pander to the 1930s obsession for speed, and later members of his princess coronation class were of conventional outline. But in the 30s, image mattered. In 1937, the first of the class reached 114 miles per hour, a new speed record, on the press run for the new Coronation Scot, at a time when competition between West and East Coast routes to Scotland was at its height. But before we look at the East Coast and LNER, we'll go in the opposite direction and cross the sea to that part of Great Britain whose railways usually receive the least attention, Northern Ireland. If these 440s look strange but familiar, it's probably because we're at an LMS shed, Belfast York Road. Here was an outpost of the United Kingdom where the mainstream railways had independent little empires. The engine backing out is a 2P, classified as U2 here in Ireland. Ten were built at Derby in 1924, and a number of earlier U-class engines were rebuilt to the same type. An earlier generation of NCC 440s, a class A1, with its microscopic boiler, is shunted by the shed pilot. Even in 1932, the LMS hadn't eliminated all traces of the Midland in Ireland. NCC stood for Northern Counties Committee, the fourth largest Irish railway, acquired by the Midland Railway in 1903. The U2 is heading out of York Road Station with a train for Larne or Londonderry, the two principal places served by the railway, which covered the northeastern part of Ulster. Number 34 is Queen Alexandra, another Class A1. It's followed by the railway's only sentinel shunter, number 91, acquired in 1925 and withdrawn during 1932, probably shortly after these views were taken.
it still seems cold up and ready for action. On the turntable is K1 class number 43, built by Sharp Stewart in 1875. The NCC had six of these large boiler dose XOs, amongst a total of only nine of that wheel arrangement. This push-pull train is seen on the Belfast and County Down Railway, on a Belfast to Hollywood working. The control trailer is a converted steam rail motor. We remain in Belfast, but move to Great Victoria Street Station on the Great Northern Railway, where we see the pride of the line Peregrine, one of five Class V three-cylinder compounds, brand new in this year, 1932. The class was the last product of G.T. Glover and were numbered 83 to 87. All bore the names of birds of prey, eagle, falcon, merlin, peregrine and kestrel. Another Glover type, a T2 class 442 tank, strides out with vintage coaches, whilst another of the same class, used for local trains and as Belfast station pilots, drifts in light engine. The GN coat of arms quoted the heraldic achievements of Londonderry, Inniskillen, Belfast and Dublin. Its main line was the trunk route between the latter cities, the only line on which the new Vs ran. Falcon has brought a train in from Dublin, and the T2 has taken the empty stock out, before Peregrine leaves with the next train for the southern Irish capital. At this time, the Great Northern painted its locomotives black and was unique in having the only international main lines in the British Isles. There are many tales of confusion when the two parts of Ireland ran their clocks on different times, as the commencement of summer time wasn't coordinated. Londonderry was also served by the LMS NCC, the legend seen on a horse box at Limavady Junction. Our cameraman was returning home via the NCC, whose single track main line ran northeast along Loch Foyle, passing through Downhill Tunnel before heading southeast to Belfast. He changed trains and headed to Larn Harbour, seen across the bay. From here he would take the LMS owned steamer bound for Stranraer on the southwestern tip of Scotland. The LMS had inherited the steamship company in 1923, when it had absorbed all its joint owners, the NCC, Midland, LNWR, Caledonian, Glasgow and Southwestern, and the Port Patrick and Wigtownshire railways. As the sun went down, he no doubt thought, leaning on the railing, about the eccentricities of Irish railways, where the most northerly line is in southern Ireland, and where a train could arrive at a station nearly an hour before it left the previous one. An Iwert Atlantic racing along the East Coast main line brings us back to the English scene. The 1930s were the last years in which these famous machines could be seen on East Coast expresses, as the Gresley Pacifics had superseded them on most duties. However, like the great war horses they were, they stood up to their successors and found employment on other express duties, for many years avoiding being demeaned on local trains. It's said that Gresley had a particular fondness for these venerable machines, and even in the 1930s was making modifications to keep them abreast of current practice. Prestige services they had control of for the first half of the decade included the All Pullman Queen of Scots and the West Riding Pullman. It was the influx of A4s and V2s in the second half of the decade which finally saw them ousted from the top duties, by which time they were, on average, 35 years old. Had it not been for the war, they might have gone then, but with the massive increase in traffic created by that conflict, they all saw out the 30s. The LNER was rather less well endowed financially than the LMS, and so it had to make do with some of its inherited stock for rather longer. The ruthless scrap-and-build policy of the latter was not so appropriate on the East Coast. 
as the LNER hadn't acquired many ineffective locomotives from its constituents. These Great Northern 440s, Small Atlantics and rugged 060s were prime examples of long-lived classes from the late 19th century, still giving sterling service. Withdrawals only started in the second part of the decade for the passenger engines, these larger J6s surviving intact for another two decades. Due to the appointment of the great Nigel Gresley, he was later knighted for his work, as its chief mechanical engineer from its inception, the LNER had enjoyed a progressive and effective locomotive policy from the outset. Gresley had come from the Great Northern Railway, where he had followed Stirling and Ivat, so that just three engineers directed the locomotive affairs of the Great Northern and LNER for over 70 years. This continuity showed in the progressive enlargement of the various goods classes of the Great Northern, which was continued into LNER days. The small Stirling classes were rebuilt and updated by Ivat, whilst the latter's J22s were continued by Gresley. Even the Great Northern classification system was continued on the LNER, although the J22s became J6s, and these Great Northern J13 and 14 tanks became LNER classes J52 and 53. LNER locomotive history might have taken a different course if the Great Central Railway CME, John George Robinson, as the most senior engineer of the constituent parts of the LNER, had accepted the post offered to him in 1923. However, he declined and recommended that the board should appoint Gresley in his stead. Gresley had responsibility both for locomotives and rolling stock, so it could be said that great central locomotives and rolling stock in the 1930s give an indication what Robinson-derived LNER standard locomotives might have looked like. These Class J11 freight engines were the last of the classic British 060s to be built by the GCR. Known as pom-poms, 174 were built as the Great Central's Class 9J between 1901 and 1910. They were rugged and powerful and were to last till the end of steam in the 1960s, some being rebuilt as late as 1942 onwards. However, after 1910, all new GCR freight engines were to be 280s, some 25 years before the Midland-dominated LMS began to build the type. Ironically, despite Robinson's retirement, he did produce a de facto LNER standard class, as his class 8K280, introduced in 1911, was selected for mass production in the First World War. 129 were built by the GCR and, together with the 19 larger boiled versions of Class 8M seen here, they became LNER Classes 04 and 05 respectively. To these were added 273 XROD machines, which brought the LNER total to 421, the larger boiled machines being rebuilt to conform to the standard version. GCR designs by Robinson and his predecessors Parker and Pollitt were very distinctive, although in LNER days so-called flowerpot chimneys replaced the original elegant designs. The flowing curves of Robinson's passenger engines, this is an LNER D9, made them amongst the most graceful locomotives on Britain's railways. Known as the bogey pom-poms, the class was originally fitted with the same boiler as the goods engines, but all were rebuilt from 1914 onwards with larger boilers. Built between 1901 and 1904, there were three GCR classes at first, 11B, C and D, which were amalgamated to form one class on rebuilding. Withdrawal of these 40 D9s started in our decade in 1939.
but the majority passed into British Railways hands in 1948. And these goods engines display two characteristic chimneys, the LNER flower pot style and Robinson's original, more graceful type. In the mid-30s, many pre-grouping classes were no longer confined to their home metals, the LNER transferring them wherever they were most suited. This brought such sites as this Great Eastern D16 Claude Hamilton on the East Coast Main Line. From May 1932, a number were used from King's Cross on the Cambridge Buffet Car Expresses, popularly known as the Beer Trains. These used the ex-Great Northern ECML as far as Hitchin, and the Claudes shared the duties with the Great Northern Atlantics. An E4240 is seen on Shed together with more Claudes. Cambridge Shed provided the Claudes for the King's Cross trains and remained one of the principal sheds on the ex-Great Eastern lines. A number of other Great Eastern types are also seen, including a suburban J69 tank, a Wurzdal-designed J15060 and another earlier J66 tank. Great Eastern and North Eastern locomotive designs were linked in style by Wurzdal, who worked for each in turn, but the largest North Eastern Express locomotives, such as this Atlantic, were the product of Sir Vincent Raven. This J21 provides the Wurzdal link. Another transfer to the northeast was Robinson's L1264 tank class. Perhaps the most significant and certainly the best known locomotives on the LNER were the legendary Gresley Pacifics. Had Robinson been appointed CME of the LNER, Gresley's A1 class would still, no doubt, have become the principal express passenger locomotives of the LNER. The only rival was the A2 class of Northeastern Pacifics that were a development of the Atlantics, but as only one type would become a group standard, Gresley's graceful design was the logical choice. Tests proved it to be superior to the Northeastern type, but comparison with the Great Western Castle in 1925 had shown that there was plenty of room for improvement, and so the A3 class was born. At the beginning of the 1930s, there were 52 A1s and 10 A3s. A further 17 A3s were built during the decade, and a program was instituted to bring the earlier locomotives into line with the updated design. The principal variation in appearance in Pacifics was the type of tender fitted, the earliest having Great Northern style tenders with coal rails. The development of the Pacific tenders is very much bound up with our final story, the quest for speed, which was the ultimate railway tale of the 1930s. The first variation occurred in the 1920s, when competition between the LMS and LNER consisted of who could run the longest through journeys, notably to Scotland. Prestige trains, such as the Queen of Scots Pullman, but particularly the Flying Scotsman were involved. So Gresley developed a corridor-fitted tender for the Pacifics, to allow crew changeover on the move. The quest for speed wasn't confined to passenger services, as improvements in wagon design had allowed higher speed freight services to be introduced, for which Gresley produced a mixed traffic version of the Pacifics, the V2262s. The first was named Green Arrow, after the fast van train the class would power. 1935 was the Silver Jubilee of King George V, and Gresley produced something special to mark the event. His streamlined A4 Pacifics, four of which were turned out that year, were to prove to be the fastest steam locomotives of all time. The Silver Jubilee train, whose coaches were also streamlined, was a sensation. On the press run of 27th of September 1935, the first A4, Silver Link, achieved 112 and a half miles per hour a new speed record. <laughs> 
Two years later, there was a new monarch and a coronation. The LMS put on the coronation Scot and took the speed title. Whilst the LMER added the coronation and West Riding Limited streamliners. On the 3rd of July 1938 came the Zenith. 4468 Mallard on a brake testing train achieved 126 miles per hour, the all time world speed record for steam. Just over a year later came war. The streamliners were put away, never to run again, and the golden decade of steam speed supremacy was over. <laughs>